So 5, 1, and 5, 2 is just going to be a review of exponents. The first four rules we're going to look at are the same as the rules that we looked at earlier in chapter 4. So I'm just going to put them on the board and go through them. And then rules 5, 6, and 7, we'll go through each of those one step at a time. Okay? The first four are the following, and we'll go through them again quickly, but we'll make sure. All right. So for this section, or for these first four here, can I get the hand there? There we go. For these first four, the first one we looked at was called product of powers. Okay, product of powers. And what did this rule tell me? Somebody tell me in their own words what rule number one really meant. What did rule number one really mean? In your own words, please. Liam. Um, you're keeping the coefficient and just adding the exponents. Good, you're keeping the base. The base, which is thought of like a coefficient, but it will call it the base. Keep the base and just add the exponents. So whenever you're multiplying things that have the same base, as Liam just said, you keep the base, so it's still x, and then the 2 plus 7 gave us this 9. It's still y, and the 3 plus 5 gave us the 8. And this is the reasoning right here. I showed you that intermediate step right there, because that's what it really looks like. There's really 9 x's there, and there's really 8 y's in that problem. Okay? So we add the exponent. We add the exponent. This needs to be second nature. You have to have these down pat. This can't be like, I need to think about it. You need to be instinctive. Like 5 times 4 is 20, right? You know your times tables? You should know this as quickly as that. Okay, so again, keep the base, add the exponent. Keep the base, add the exponent. Good. Uh, rule number 2. Rule number 2 simply says that what? In your own words, what does rule number 2 say? Exactly. That's exactly right. Anything to the power of zero is one. That's got to be something that's memorized. The reasoning I showed you last class is what you're seeing here. A simple way to remember it is to start, like, say, two to the second is four, two to the first is two, and what's happening is these are having. So two to the zero has got to be one. And we did this in the last class when we were in, like, section four, three, I think it was, and we started with this. Okay? Let's take a look at the third rule now. The third rule. What does the third rule tell me? What does the third rule tell me in your own words? Focus, Summer. Third rule, what does it tell me? Dave, go ahead. You have a power to another power, you can just multiply Yeah, when you have a power to a power, simply multiply those powers. Reasoning is given right here. X to the third to the fourth is really X cubed, X cubed, X cubed, X cubed, which is X to the twelfth. And three times four is indeed twelve. So you could skip this rule or skip all that work and jump right to there just by multiplying those powers. And the fourth rule that we looked at, the fourth rule, in your own words, what does the fourth rule tell us? And you don't have to remember them, by the way, as the fourth rule, just knowing what to do here. What does it tell us in your own words? In your own words here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You distribute the power when it's a product. So if there are two things that are being multiplied, and then you raise both of those things to the same power, say in this case C, you're raising them both individually to the power C. Okay, so 4 times 2 to the third, well that's really 8 to the third or 5, 12, but we could break it up and show that that's true. Because 4 times 2 to the third is really 4 to the third times 2 to the third. 4 to the third is 64, 2 to the third is 8, you still get 5, 12. So showing it or proving it to you that, yeah, you can multiply these and then raise it to the third, and that's what you get. Or you can simply raise each of these to the third first and then multiply the answer, and you get the same thing here. Okay, so again, when there is a product and there's a power outside of that product, you raise each of them or you distribute them. Okay, but not to be confused with the distributive law that we know already. Okay, don't use that word distributive if you're like writing it down. But the idea is that you're like distributing it again here. Okay, it's like you're taking the C and putting it to each of those factors in the parentheses. So these are the four rules that we covered in section 4.3, I think is the section we looked at these. Now let's look at 5, 6, and 7 and see how they differ. Okay, let's take a look at 5, 6, and 7. Rule number 5, the quotient of powers. Quotient of powers. Yeah, so it's the same idea as the product of powers. And with product of powers, we added the exponents. So Hannah notices right away, you keep the base, 
and you simply subtract the exponents. You subtract the exponents. Let's take a look at an example. Pick a number worth from 1 to 10. Pick a number from 0 to 5, Tori May. All right, so x to the 6th over x to the 5th. Well, what does that really mean? x to the 1st. Well, how did you get that? 6 minus 5 is? Yeah, and isn't it the same thing as doing this? And then noticing that, oh, wait, there's 5 here, and 5 of these cancel, leaving behind simply this x, which is where that comes from. So again, the idea here, the idea here is that in these problems, we're going to see that if you have a numerator and a denominator, simply subtract the exponents. Now, what happens though, what happens though if the numerator is smaller than the denominator? What happens if the numerator is smaller than the denominator? Dave? Yeah, you'll get a negative power you'll get a negative power. So let's take a look at an example of that to lead us into the next, the next rule. So before we go to the next rule, let's say we had a to the third over a to the fifth. What's three minus five, everybody? Yeah, negative two. So this is really a to the negative two. But if I were to write it out, what would it look like? Yeah, because we have this. And we'll notice that three of these cancel with three of these. But when you cancel something, you have to leave a one behind. Like earlier, up here. Look back up here. When we canceled these five x's, we left a one behind. So this is really x to the one over one. But anything over one is itself, so this didn't really matter here. But now it does matter. There's a one that's left behind right here. It's a placeholder. It matters. Because as Dave said just now, this is really... 1 over a squared. But we said it's a to the negative 2. But by showing the work, it comes out to be 1 over a squared. So what correlation can you make? That by doing the work, we get 1 over a squared, but by using our rule, we get a to the negative 2. What's the significance or what's the relationship here? Liam? Yeah, it's the reciprocal really with a switch sign though, right? So what we're saying is, and what Liam is noticing is that if we have something like this to the negative power, it's really like the reciprocal but to the positive power. It's a reciprocal but to the positive power. Well, this is our next rule, actually. Our next rule is that if we have a negative exponent ever, write it as 1 over the positive exponent, but the same exact way. So let's take a look at that rule now. Hey, here's our rule right here, and this is what we just wrote. We just wrote it on the last slide, whether you realize it or not, but we used... 2 instead of b. We said a to the negative 2 was 1 over a squared. Well, that's what this says right here in that box. In that box, it's telling me, well, if I ever have a negative exponent, let me just put it in the denominator and make it positive. Okay? Let me put it in the denominator and make it positive. So, what do you suppose you would do if you had something like this, though? Well, that's a negative exponent, but now it's in the denominator. Yeah, so instead of being in the denominator, now we move it to the numerator and make it positive. Well, that's the same thing as that. Those are identical also. So the idea here, and write this in words, please. It's very simple if you remember what I'm going to tell you. Whenever you have a negative exponent, whenever you have a negative exponent, move it to the other part of the fraction, meaning if it's in the numerator, put in the denominator, if it's in the denominator, put in the numerator, and make it a positive exponent. So whenever you have a negative exponent, move it to the other part of the fraction, which you might not notice is there, there's always a denominator, and make the exponent positive. And make the exponent positive. I also want to take a quick look at this other rule that I wrote down. And the reason I write down this rule, your book doesn't describe both rules, but I like to write this as well, is because it's widely used. Okay, you'll see this a lot, where there's a negative exponent with either with a uh, quotient inside of it. So for this rule, what I would really be seeing is the following. 
And if we think about our old rule, we remember that we have, we have a exponent out here, we can distribute it to both of these. So this is technically, right, that's what it really is, a to the negative c over b to the negative c. That's what this is saying. We're raising this quotient, a over b, to the negative c power. So we would distribute the negative c to both of them, or raise them both to the negative c. But again, when you have a negative exponent, what did I just say a moment ago you should do? What should you do with a negative exponent? And aren't they both negative here? So we're going to just switch them both and make them positive. So this becomes b to the c over a to the c. This one moves up here. This one moves down here, which is really what this is. That's what this is saying up here at the top. This is really b to the c over a to the c. So this is another good rule to remember. If you have a quotient with a negative exponent, you can just simply flip the numerator and denominator and make it a positive exponent. It's the same thing we said. Okay, so remember, please, when there's a negative exponent, flip or switch the location of whatever your base is or wherever your base is. Okay, wherever your base is. <clears throat> let's see if I want to do an example of this. Um, all right, let's try one that looks like the following. Let's say we have x squared y, z to the fourth, all over, x to the fifth, y to the second, z. What we want to do is simplify this. Okay, we want to do is simplify this. Now, there are two ways to simplify this. We could use our rule of exponents and subtract whenever we see. So we have 2 minus 5 here. We have 1 minus 2 and 4 minus 1. Or we can think physically in our mind what is happening. How many x's are there in the top, really? How many x's are there in the top as factors? How many of them? How many? 2. How many x's are in the bottom? Everybody? 5 in the bottom, right? x to the 5th. So there's 5 in the bottom and 2 up top. If I cancel the two up top with two from the bottom, how many are left in the bottom? Three. So one way to do this is just to simply simplify it and say, well, that's x to the third. Okay, because there's two up top. These two x's are really written like this. These five are really written like this. So technically speaking, I can just cancel. Okay, I can cancel these two with these two, leaving behind three x's. That's where x to the third comes from. That's one way to approach these problems, and that always works. And personally, I actually do that a lot. I, I approach it that way. Another way to approach this problem, an alternate way, is to use our rules. What's 2 minus 5, everyone? Negative 3. So this would be x to the negative third. No more, no more fraction in this problem here. Okay, we'll, we'll see that there's two different answers we're going to see. Now, if I continue, if I continue in the way we were going here, what would it become for the y part? What would the y become? If I did y to the first over y to the second, I subtracted the exponents again, what would I get? And the other one just becomes a y here, good. And what about the z? What about the z? What would I get when I simplified z? Tori May. Um, z to the second on top? Not second. We have four. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Z to the third. Yeah, z to the third up top here, or 4 minus 1 is still z to the third down here. So that part wouldn't change much. Well, those look like two different answers, don't they? Are they different at all? They're different in the way they look, but are they actually different? Why not? Which is really like taking them in. Yeah, so take a look here. These negative exponents that Arthur is mentioning, remember if it's a negative exponent, we just said move it, right? So take these two here that I'm circling and imagine moving them to the denominator because they're both negative, right? These are both negative exponents. So you would technically move them both down to the denominator, but there is no denominator. So you make a denominator. Simply go like this. Just rewrite everything that's positive in the numerator and then put the stuff that was negative in the denominator and you get back to the answer that we had up here. 
So again, with these problems, there's not just one way to approach them and to solve them. You can use your rules of subtracting. You can use your rules of subtracting, and then you can go ahead and you can... Hold on, let me clear that because this is not working now. You can use your rules of subtracting and then go ahead and rewrite them, or you can think about them in your mind as how many are in the top, how many are in the bottom, and when they cancel, what is really left behind? Okay, what is left behind? Let me just reconnect to AirPlay. Are you kidding me?